Again, hi everybody and welcome. Today is the third week. We're uh, going to embark on two concepts today. Originally, we were planning only to do one of them, but because it's kind of light, I thought we should combine chapters five and six together today. So if you guys think it's too much, you may stop me, okay? So that we don't do that. But because I know down the road, there are some heavy concepts that probably need time to, do, to be developed. So probably we'll need more time on them. So basically it's you are the ones who are in the driver's seat, okay? Mm -hmm. That answer is one of the questions that we were raising earlier. I think, I don't know if it's Arkel or somebody else who picked up on it. Uh, that the live sessions sometimes have advantage in that making them custom made and uh, basically personal and things like that. So that's one thing. So this is basically one of the changes I'm making today. Uh, the other thing also is, is uh, I'm sorry, that's my watch bugging me with some messages and things like that. Anyway, the other thing also is that uh, so let me first of all address the question of you, one of you guys that uh, she sent. And the question basically deals with, first of all, I apologize if I don't really get back with you guys immediately. Sometimes I look at the message, especially when it comes to my cell phone or the message. When it comes to Canvas, I know exactly which class that is so I can look up the name. But if it's coming from uh, on uh, an email and dependent to, through the system or coming to uh, as a text message, sometimes I really don't know first of all, how to answer the question because I don't know what the class is, okay? So uh, I'm either researching or defer this question to later on or something. So if I don't respond to that, it's because probably I don't know. So it's a good idea to identify yourself when you're messaging me outside of uh, uh, Canvas, namely through the inbox, by telling me not only your name, but also which class you're in so that I know how to answer and give you a better, more uh, uh, prompt response to your question. So the question basically, and it was from one of your classmates basically is related to the exams, okay? And whether or not in the exams we will need cameras. So the answer to that is a no, you don't need a camera for the exam, okay? So uh, the exams are actually in such a way that no two of you will have the same exam. So first of all, that is going to be resolved this way. The other thing also, you will barely have time to do the actual exam and post it. So you don't really have time to, 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 uh, to, uh, to do other things. Obviously, if you have your book, it's an open book exam. So if you have your book before you, you can scan quickly or do something, but that's part of the deal that we have right now for the online exams. So that's a question that she asked and I was able to answer it after basically I identified the uh, student or the class at least. And uh, then the other question was, is it gonna be multiple choice? Okay, for this class, for physics 10 class, there are the two formats okay, for the exams. You will have the multiple choice questions and you will also have a, a short uh, answers basically where you're going to do probably a one step to two step calculations. So you need to know the algebra a little bit how to multiply and how to divide and how to convert from one unit to another or something like that to quickly come up with a number and there will be several practice stuff leading to the exam as a matter of fact before each exam there will be a practice exam there will be an exam review actually to put it more in uh, and that exam review will be graded as participation so you really have to do the review if you don't do it you don't get any participation the grade for it is going to be maxed regardless of how many mistakes you make in the review exam. So if the review exam is out of 180 points, for example, and you only get like 20 points out of 180, which puts it around 10%, but you're going to not get 10% uh, for that one. The fact that you just do the review will get the full credit for the review. This is to encourage you basically to participate in the class and get engaged and do the max so that you prepare yourself for the actual exam, in which case you're going to answer those things and do them well. So this is basically uh, in relation to one of your uh, classmates and I was making the big fuss over the classroom because as I was mentioning earlier, I have several classes this semester so I really need to know where you are so that I can tailor make the answers to you and things like that. Is this clear? This for those who are here right now? Yes. It's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna okay. be clearer as we move along and you will see the style of how this thing is working, okay? 
So that's basically the whole part. You already have an assignment this week. This is physics 10. We are in week three. So you already have an assignment that is due March 12th. March 12th is next Friday, not this Friday, next Friday. And it's related to uh, basically week two materials. And it's, it's made up of, uh, so if you don't have the book, and that's one of the questions that was asked several times before, if you really don't have the book, I have the questions in here. It helps a lot to have the book. If you can buy the book, rent it so that you understand what's going on in here. But the questions in here, and there are five of them, they're inside in there. And you will see in the bottom how these problems are graded. Uh, the, all of these problems are getting 30 points and you will see exactly how, when can you get a full credit for this assignment and when can you get just partial credit for it. And uh, you see the questions in there. So you should be able to answer this once you're supposed to uh, basically submit your answer in there, either by scanning a document or taking pictures of it and uploading it. And then when I go grading through it, I follow the rubric. So probably it's a good idea that you go while you're answering the, the, these problems in here, following the rubric. Now, this is a homework, which is different than an exam or a quiz. In a sense, you can work together. This is not to challenge you to see if you have retained knowledge or not. This is to help you know things, okay? So homework, the philosophy behind it is different than a quiz or an exam, okay? This is to prepare you for other things. So you are very much welcome to consult with one of your peers, and there is no time limit on this one, and work with them, okay, on finding an answer to these questions and move on, okay? So what I want you to get from this exercise is that you know how to do these things. Ask me, for example, you guys got stuck in something and you cannot move with it, please ask me and tell me, a question, for example, four, it's asking for so-and-so and we did it and we're not sure about it. What do you think? Okay, I have no problem with you helping you and getting the, the, the this thing resolved. Because again, the bottom line is that you know how these things are done. Does this also help with this homework assignment? Yes, it does. Thank you because I did have questions about it. <laughs> okay, no problem. As long as you guys are aware of this, contact each other, please be safe. Do not get together. At least follow the, all of the requirements that the county is putting out there and the college is putting there in terms of getting together. Work collaboratively online. If you want me to facilitate that, and I will be more than happy to do that, put you in a group or something like that and get you in a session and you guys can work together. There is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. As a matter of fact, you are encouraged to do this. It's not like a, maybe if I do it, it's going to look not so great about me. Negative, as a matter of fact, it's going to be positive because of the fact that this is, physics especially is a collaborative endeavor where people work together on doing things. And you're picking up those habits. When you go to the workplace, that's also something that is expected from you. So you need to develop that skill, that skill, okay? So that's something that I want you guys to pay attention to during, and it's going to be throughout the semester, some things like this, in addition to quizzes, in addition to exams and things like that, and participation stuff and everything else. Hopefully, these things are clear, and if you guys have any questions about them, please send them, okay? Don't, don't, uh, don't uh, be shy about them. Okay, there was also another change. I don't know if you noticed, at least for those who are not in class, they don't attend live. They probably usually, sometimes they used to go to confer Zoom and find the recordings in there and watch them. That is not the right place for it. And I already delete them because first of all, the college asks us to delete them to save space on the system. So we're doing that and I'm posting them on YouTube and actually uh, giving the links and the discussion sessions where they, where they need to go. So those are the technical things. And the last thing that I was going to ask is, and probably I will do a survey for that and I will send it to the class. If you guys can start early this class, because I was complaining about the fact that there's a big span and some of you are already free, apparently they don't have any classes also. So if we can start it around instead of 3 p.m. to around 2.30 p.m. And if that works for everybody, then we're going to make it official for Tuesday and Thursday. Okay? I can do that. That works okay. for me too. Okay, again, watch for a survey that is going to be posted on Canvas. 
and uh, you all you have to do is just put your name in there and basically if you're agreeing with the change then we'll make it official and send an announcement so that everybody knows about it okay so let's start the stuff that we're supposed to be doing and that's chapter five isn't it so chapter five is about newton's third law of motion Okay, so here is the deal so far. We've discovered the first law of Newton and basically says that if an object, object, under no net forces. And it tells us what that object is. If that object was moving, it's going to continue moving in a straight line. If it were, that object was stationary, it's going to stay where it is. So this is the law of inertia. So basically V, V stays the same constant, doesn't change, okay? If it was zero, it stays zero. If it was a value, it's going to stay that value in the same direction. That's why I put the vector on top of it to indicate that this is actually a direction, but the direction and the magnitude stay the same. Okay, that's the first law. The second law that we examined so far, if an object is under Net forces. So yes, basically, if you want to change that, then in this case, it's going to change motion in such a way that the rate of change of motion is proportional to this force and inversely proportional to its inertia. The more inertia you have in here, the less change in motion you have in here. And for some reason, my 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 PowerPoint keeps on dancing between. I don't know what it's saying, but the point in here is that there is a change in motion. Okay. And that change in motion, namely the acceleration, which is the change in velocity. And I made the big fuss also over the fact that this change can happen in one of two ways, either in direction or in magnitude, okay? And that is basically in a nutshell, what the second law is, how change in motion is. So what causes in this case, the change in motion is the force. What force does in this case, it causes the change in motion. So there is a causality in here, relationship between uh, uh, force as a cause and the effect as being the, the change in motion. The mass in this case, or the inertia plays the role of a spoiler, if you wish. The more you have of it, the less effect you're gonna see, okay? So this is the resistance of an object to the change in motion. If it was stationary and you want to make it move, the more mass you have, the more force you need to apply in order to get the same change in motion if you expect it for a less, a less mass than that. So there's a lot of things that can be said in here for this one. Hopefully that is for the past two chapters. Now the third chapter deals with another problem altogether. It would have been great if the universe is made up of a single object. If the universe is made up of a single object, then we have it fully covered because we have two possibilities if the object is under, a net, under net forces or under no net forces. If it's under no net forces, it's law number one. So this is the first law. If it's under net forces, then it's the second law, end of the story, and that's it. And you go home and everybody is happy, okay? The question I wanna ask you, is the universe made up of a single object? Do we have a single object in the universe? No. <laughs> How many do we have? Two? Three, maybe? Mm. We don't know. How many? Like million? Is it billion? What? <laughs> billion? <laughs> okay. It's a lot. The number was That's so many zeros that we couldn't even see the end of it. Okay, so there is more than a single object in the universe and there you guys are all right. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, okay? So we have more than a single uh, object and Jacob agrees that too many, okay? So there is too many. So that's it. So we have, that's why we really need the third, the, the third law. So what the third law is saying is the following. Now, since we have the possibility of having a more than a single object in the universe, then we have to deal with that. 
neither the first law nor the second law talk about more than a single object. Both of them deal with a single object. That's why the third law is needed, okay? So the third law basically says the following. If you have more than a single object, you have two possibilities in this case. Either those two objects are, if those objects are interacting or not interacting. If they are not interacting, each one of them can be isolated by itself and it boils down either to the first law or the second law. So if they're not interacting, you're actually all you need is the first law or the second law. But now if they do interact, we have a problem because we need to know how that interaction is happening. Now here is where the third law comes in. If two objects interact and one of them exerts a force on the second, the second exerts a force on this first in such a way that these two forces are equally in magnitude but opposite in direction. There it is, that's the third law. So basically, now we have two or more objects and the key for it in here, interacting. Man, this thing is gonna be annoying today, interacting. If they do, then if one of them exerts a force on the second, the second will exert a force on the first in such a way that these two forces are both equally in magnitude. If the first one is 10 Newton, the second one is 10 Newton. If the first one is five Newton, the second one is five Newton. But their direction is opposite to one another. That's it. So this is sometimes referred to as the action and reaction principle. And this is the third law. Now the picture is complete. You don't need any more laws to describe the universe because all objects in the universe are fully tallied, are fully accounted for. You have a single object by itself, how to deal with it, whether in their net forces or no net forces. You have many objects and how to deal with them. If they are not interacting, we default back to one or the other two laws. If they are interacting, you need to invoke the third law and you're done. Okay, so this is basically where the importance of the third law comes into play. Okay, other than that, that's it. That's the, all, everything that we would want to know about the universe are may, can be understood in this context of the three laws of Newton. Okay, so this is the last one of them. Okay, I promise there will be no more laws of Newton. This is it, that's the last one, okay? Which makes you wonder why in the world then we're going to do what we do. So what's the point of the next chapter? So we're done with the physics then. Isn't this what this sounds to? So we can wait until uh, June, take the final, and we're done. Doesn't seem to sound. <laughs> yeah, there was actually more details that we need to ask, okay? Because if all of it that, to understand basically of motion and how it happens, we're done, actually. That's it. So we're going to ask questions down the road, and please, please hold me to my to my to my uh, to the standards also, because I really want you guys to 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 have a feel for it. I know this is not calc based and all of that, but I really want you to understand the rationale with it. You, I want you to also be critiquing what is before you, whether physics or other subjects. I just stated the three laws of Newton, describing describing basically how they do things for us and they promise to solve everything. And if that's the case, then if let's assume we know how this were, laws work and we know how to apply them, then give me any problem in physics, I should be able to solve it by invoking either the first law or the second law or the third law and I'm done. Once I'm done with that, then we're, 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 we're home free. So that's basically what the promise of this, this laws are, okay? So, we're going to answer that question down there. As a matter of fact, we'll try to answer it today when it comes to chapter six, which deals with momentum. So why do we have to introduce that concept to begin with? Okay. So again, uh, the fact that forces are vectors and that's I already put the, an arrow on top of them in here to indicate the size, okay? And the summary of Newton's three laws of motion, which is really all of this that I wrote in here, okay? So this is the discussion item to put in your own words, however you choose to, try to understand them and then put them in your own words, uh, uh, the three laws of Newton. Uh, 
Oh man, I cannot try it without that thing bugging me. Can we do something else in here? But if we do... This car, uh, no. Okay. Man, it pops up and then it leaves. Okay, sorry about this thing in here. There is, uh, my computer is thinking about what's going on, I guess. Anyway, so an interaction is between one thing and another thing. That's what I was, uh, what we referred to. So if you put in an object, the object pulls back on you. If you push an object, the object push back on you. The fact that your the earth is pulling on you actually is also the same thing you're pulling on the earth. Okay, so that is an act and reaction. One of them cannot happen without the other, okay? So this interaction cannot happen in, on, by itself. It has to be, it has to have two hands. You cannot really clap with just one hand. You have to have two hands to hear the clapping. That's the same thing with the interaction in this case, okay? So one exerts a force on the other. So in this case, there must be two objects to do the thing. For example, this guy is pushing on the wall. The wall is pushing back on him. And that is an interaction at this point, okay? We have two objects and the objects are clearly the hand and the wall, or at least this portion of the wall, okay? That is where the interaction is happening. Don't worry about this side of the wall that is not involved or this part of the person that is not involved. The only place that is involved in this case is the hand and the portion from the wall that touches the hand. So there is an interaction there, okay? So it requires a pair of forces and these pair of forces are called basically a uh, action reaction. Which one is action, which one is reaction? They're just a matter of semantics. Which one to call, it's like that movie, what is it? The uh, thing one and thing two, okay? If, I don't know if you guys remember that movie with the, the hat, the cat and the hat. Do you guys remember those movie? I haven't, you guys didn't see it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is thing one, thing two, okay? Which one is thing one, which one is thing two? It's just a matter of just naming them, okay? Same thing, action, reaction. They are actually, which one to call action, which one to call reaction, it's really, it's not the fact that, yeah, it's clearly that probably the person moved, but in other scenarios, the wall could move, okay? And the person has to put his hand or to protect himself from the wall. So in this case, it's still the same thing. If you, if you remove the, the interaction, both forces will go in the same time, okay? So whenever an object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts a force on an equal and opposite on the first one. And this is proven time and again. In this case, for example, the hammer is hitting the nail and the nail is actually hitting the hammer in the same time during that interaction, okay? So what you see in this case, yes, you probably see in this case, this hammer getting a little bit more damage, it looks like to it, and it's driven inside and it looks like it's the one that is uh, subjected to the action, but also the hammer in the same time thing, but the hammer is just because of its structure, it doesn't look like it's getting much of the action because it's heavier than the nail in this case, otherwise it's being pushed by the same exact force upward in here, okay? So a soccer, soccer ball, a soccer player kicks a ball with 1500 Newton of force. The ball exerts a reaction force against the player. How much do you think it's going to be? Fifteen thousand Newton. Yeah, fifteen thousand. That's too much. Fifteen hundred. Okay, it has to be the same thing. That's 150 kilograms. 150 kilograms is about 300 pounds. Uh, probably it's believable. It has to be a very hard ball in this case, okay? This is probably uh, one of those players who, okay, so that's believable. So the correct answer is, again, it's because of the action reaction. So the, the, the player is here. It is, again, the action is happening in here only, okay? So, oh man, he cannot draw the ball without this thing moving, okay? Sorry. So he, hits the ball this way, the ball hits the player this way, and now that is action reaction, okay? If you don't believe me, just try it and you will see that it really hurts sometimes. So action reaction force, one force is called the action force, the other one is called the, the reaction force, are co-pairs of a single interaction. So they are just telling you what's going on in there. That's explaining the interaction. Neither force exists without the other, are equal in strength and opposite in, um, in direction, always act on different objects, okay? So that's their properties, okay? 
So the third law, to every action, there is always an, oppo uh, an opposed and equal reaction. So that's basically what it is. So here is an example of a car. The car, what makes the car move? What force makes the car move? Combustion energy. Okay, that's energy. That's not force. That's a good question for the discussion. That's the question too. What makes a car move? That's item two of the discussion. We're keeping tab of them. Okay, somebody said the combustion energy. Let me do, do the following scenario, okay? If you take the car and lift it up from the ground, like for example, they do in the service station and turn on the engine combustion or whatever, up to the maximum RPM that you can think of, is the car going to go anywhere? No. So it's not the combustion energy. As a matter of fact, you can do the same experiment on an icy day. I know it doesn't do that here in Southern California, but in some other places where the uh, it rains ice and- The friction? Very good, that's the correct answer. Friction is. Without friction, you cannot move a car. Here is what's going on. So you have your, your engine, basically, combustion engine, basically driving the pistons up and down, and that is going to go to the drive shaft. Yeah, that's going to spin around, and that is going to drive the axle, and the axle drives the tires, and now the tires are spinning, okay? So the tires are spinning and the tire wants to spin this way. And as it's spinning this way, it's pressing against the ground. The ground is pushing the ground with this force. The ground will push it with an equal and opposite force. So at the end, the external force that causes this motion is the friction, pushing the cars in the moving in the forward direction. The car is moving this way because the friction is actually in the same direction as the one that is driving the car, it's moving the car in, uh, forward. So the combustion engine in here and the pistons and all of the things I was describing and the axle and all of these things, those are internal forces. We'll see that they don't play anything, including this force, by the way, with which the car is pushing on the, on the road. If I lift the car, as a matter of fact, there will be no contact and this action reaction principle would not apply and the car will not go anywhere, okay? or put it on the nice conditions in here. So the correct answer to this one, yes, it's friction. And actually what makes you move too is friction too. If you stand on an icy day and you try to move, you cannot go anywhere, you stand there too. So friction is a good thing, okay? It's an undesirable thing though inside the engine because it makes the engine overheat and it takes from the energy of the system. So, and actually the it's overheat so that the, the parts will rub against one another and then the whole thing stops working. So you need to put oil to absorb that heat and get rid of it and keep the, uh, the, aisle, uh, the, the, the car basically moving. So yeah, it's not good inside the, the engine but it's without it, the car cannot move. So who mentioned that, Brandon? Excuse me? Are you the one who said the friction is the correct, uh, the, the, the car that moves the car? I okay, did, yes. Okay, so please make that in the discussion. That's item two of the discussion today. And again, this is another example of how action reaction principle works in here. And that is actually by having the rocket lift off the ground to begin with, or actually move in the sky if it's uh, to gain more velocity. Again, the rocket in this case is pushing the gas. There is a gas that is escaping from the rocket. And as this gas is escaping, it pushes the rocket forward. So that is actually the third law of Newton is the one that helps us uh, lift off from the ground, okay? So it's really an important law to help us understand a lot of mechanics. Without it, if there was no action reaction and the, 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 the rocket is pushing the gas, then if this is not applies, then the rocket is gonna stay in its place, just pushing the gas and it's not going anywhere, okay? So when you step off of a curb, earth pulls on you downward, the reaction to this force is you pull on the earth with the same force, okay? We'll discuss that. So as long as there is interaction and there is interaction between you and the earth in this case, so there is the action and reaction principle in, the, in this case at its full glory. So again, here is an example with a cannonball, okay? Okay, 
So you have a cannon in here. I'm going to describe it. And you have a cannonball in this case, OK? This one has a big mass, and this one has a small mass. So when this fire is basically what it is good, it's doing, the, 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 uh, the powder inside the cannon, it's, it ex basically it explodes, it, it reacts. And then that one will push the, cannon, uh, the cannonball all the way to the end. So when it leaves at this point, the force with which it's pushed is the same force as it's applied to the cannonball, to the cannon itself in this case. But this one will result in a higher acceleration because this force on the cannon it, on the cannonball itself is the mass. Oh man, we can why is this doing that? Sorry about this. So the, the acceleration on this one, A, is simply equal to the force divided by the mass, whereas the acceleration in this case, the recoil motion of the cannon itself is going to be an acceleration, which is the force, the same force in magnitude divided by a bigger mass. So this acceleration will be a lot less than this acceleration. And hence, the cannon ball in this case travel further because it has higher acceleration. So it's the same law in this case. And that is if you shoot a gun, that is the recoil motion that you're going to feel in this case from the gun. That is the same thing in here, OK? And here is the example in here. When a cannon, a cannon is fired, the acceleration of the cannon cannonball are different because they have different masses or different inertia. That's all. So the cannon will recoil backward, but not as much as the cannonball, which travels further away because it gains more acceleration. Does this make sense to you guys? Yes. The key thing in here is that the forces are the same. The force exerted by the cannonball on the cannon and the force exerted by the cannon on the cannonball is the same force. It's actually the internal reaction that is inside, the, 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 the explosion, if you wish, that happened from, from the powder inside, OK? And this is an example of an explosion, actually, OK? In the case of an, impl an implosion, it's similar, which is the opposite of this one. Here is a typical example. You have a bus and you have a bug, and they collide. The force are the same. But which one suffers the highest acceleration or deceleration in this case is going to be the bug because it has very little inertia compared to the bus. So it has so much acceleration, actually, the bug that probably it's, it's inside <laughs> will, will be smashed, OK? It's just tremendous acceleration. You don't want that, OK? For, for the bus, you probably ha hardly notice any kind of slowing down, although the same force is applied to the two, OK? So that's the same principle in this case, OK? This is an implosion, though. The first example for the cannonball is an explosion because you have two things, and now they are separate. You have a cannonball inside the cannon, and now they're gone. In this example, though, you have two things separate, and now they come together, and they become one thing. So this is actually an example of an implosion. What is the first example is an example of explosion. OK? And it's the same principle. The force is the same. Because as much as the bus hits the bug and basically hurt it, the, the, the same force is by the bug against the bus. But the only reason why the bus does not suffer much deceleration versus how much deceleration the, 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 the bug will suffer is because of the inertia. That's all. The bug has a lot less mass than that of the air the bus. Make sense? When I was talking earlier about an object and an object this and an object that, it really depends on what you mean by system. It's clearly in here, if I'm talking about this orange by itself, sitting on top of this cart in here, and it's being pulled by an external force, in this case, this is not part of any interaction whatsoever. It's a force applied just to this object in here. So this is not an action and reaction. There is no reaction. It's just something is pulling on it, end of the story. So this is my system now, Okay, an isolated system. This is my object. The object in here is clearly this cart with its wheels and also the orange. All of it is my object. And in this case, there is a net force. So if I apply the second, the, which law I apply, this, in this case, is going to be the second law of Newton. Now, if somebody comes to you and tell you, you know what, 
it's actually an orange pulling on it. I mean, an apple pulling, pulling on it. It doesn't matter. As far as this system is concerned, the apple is an external force. So if you want to do a free body diagram, you remove this one, you replace it by its force, just like what we did in the previous slide. And that's the end of it. It's still the same system, okay? And as far as it's concerned, this is outside of it. Yes, if you're worried about the apple, this force that it is applied is equal in magnitude to this force, but opposite in direction. And that is due actually to the string between them. So the apple is interacting with string and the string is interacting with the system and we are, in, we are all in business. So this is where my interaction is actually happening. So it's pulling on the string, the string is pulling back, the string now is pulling on this one and this one is pulling back on it. So, but if I include this portion of the string in here, as far as it's concerned, it's being pulled outside by something. Okay, so that is what we mean by system or an object. Okay. Now, if I include the uh, the apple as part of the system, this becomes an internal force, and they cancel because they're equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So, in this case, if I'm interested in this whole thing as being a system, I have to be careful now. If somebody comes in and cuts the string. Well, this will fly in this way, and the other one will fly backward in such a way that center of mass doesn't change. The center of mass stays in here in the middle somewhere, okay? But as long as the string is in there, this situation doesn't exist, and this is my system now. So these two forces do not play in terms of the dynamics of the overall system, okay? Because now it's part of it, so they're they, they are mutually canceling. I need to know what's going on between this tires and the floor and this uh, the feet of this apple and the floor in order to really find the effects of external forces, okay? And that will be, if the friction is involved, then this apple is pressing. Let's say, for example, this is frictionless. This is so smooth that uh, friction is not involved. Then in this case, it's clearly as the apple is pressing on the floor, the floor is pressing forward and this will be the external force, the force of friction due to the ground, okay? Now, if somebody somehow thinks that the entire planet Earth and this system are only one system, then in this case, even the friction becomes a, a, a internal force. I mean, uh, yeah, internal force, which is mutually canceled as the apple is pressing on the, on, the, on, the, on the Earth, the Earth is pressing forward and they too also mutually cancel. So I have to look for external forces on the system. So you have to really know what you mean by system. Where is the limits of the system in order to isolate it and study it? So in this case, if my concern for the system were the apple and the orange and this cart part of the system and this rope also part of the system, if all of that by system, then clearly the friction is an external force and that is the one that is causing motion. Same thing as my example in there earlier about the car. When we were talking about the car, we, I was very careful in here to say the following, that what is happening in the pistons on the, on the, on the flywheel, flywheel, I think that's how it's called, and Villebrequin, that's how they say it in French, I don't know. I think it's flywheel. That is the one that drives the, 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 uh, from, the from the pistons, that drives the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, or is it drive shaft? I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a mechanic, okay, so. Anyway, the point is at the end, the axle starts uh, spinning and as it does, it spins the tires. All of these are internal forces and there is the action reaction principle applies to them, but they don't participate whatsoever in the external motion of the car, including up to this force in here. It's part of the internal force. The only external force in here is that of the friction, okay? The road pushes on tire, okay? And the same thing in here also in this case for this system too. Make sense? Yes. Okay, very good. So again, So again, now we're concerned with another type of actually a uh, reaction in this case, consider the flight of a helicopter when lift is greater than the helicopter's uh, uh, weight, the helicopter will move upward in this case. So basically you have, again, 
the weight. Now the weight is actually a force that is a, that is an external force coming from the gravity of the Earth. And then you have this blades that are spinning so fast, uh, creating a lift. And we're going to talk about that when we get into uh, uh, aerodynamics. And that lift will be a force moving upward in here if the angle is correct for the blades. So if this lift, again, is bigger than the weight, of course, this one is going to push upward. What is happening in here is between the blades and the, and the air is that the blades are pressing against the air and the air is pressing back against it. And that's how liftoff happens in here for, for this helicopter, OK? So all of this is just examples of uh, 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 action reaction. Okay, which brings me to uh, the topic of vectors because uh, these forces are vectors. And a good example to understand vectors is through the velocity. When you throw a rock, an object, up in the sky and come back, in this case, the velocity is in one direction and comes back. When you throw it vertically, again, is in one direction to the other. But when you throw it at an angle in this case, it has components both in vertical direction and horizontal direction. And you have what is known as a projectile motion. So in this case, you have a component in the horizontal direction. You have a component in the vertical direction. And the actual velocity is the sum of these two vectors. So if you ever going to add two vectors, this is what you do. You come, so these are the two vectors you really had in mind to add up. So this is vector A, and this is vector B, and I want to sum them up. I can take this vector and move it so that its beginning is the end of the previous vector. And then I draw one that is equal in length and parallel to the initial vector. Because a vector is defined as magnitude and direction. It's not defining with a starting point and ending point. Because this vector has the same magnitude as this one, and it's also the same direction. Both of them are pointing north. Then in this case, this is actually the same vector as B as the first one. This will be the sum of these two vectors. That is head to tail, basically, sum on how we do that uh, in vectors. Okay. Another way of doing this sum, again, is to actually do it. Leave the vector B alone. Don't mess with it. So the vector B stays in here. This is where the vector A used to be. So all I'm going to do is come to the tail of the second and draw one that is equal in magnitude to the vector A and the same direction. As long as I maintain the direction, which is in this case east, then I'm in good shape. Then in this case, actually, this is the same vector A drawn from a different point in space. Okay, And uh, this is the sum of the two vectors. Okay, This is what I call A plus B which is the same thing as this sum A plus B. So you have choices on how to do it, okay? Here is an example. We want camping, you and I, okay? The entire classroom, okay? Not one of you guys. And I wondered, okay? I left the camp, here is base, okay? And uh, I left base, for example, walking five miles east. I know it's east because I looked at my GPS, it tells me I'm going east. So this is five miles. And then I stopped, rested a little, and then I walked another five miles due north. But I get so tired in here, and uh, I want you guys to come straight and uh, bring me back, basically, with the car or whatever we have in there, or something that can travel the terrain that we have in there. So how are you going to do it? Obviously, one way of achieving the same thing is going same thing five miles this way and five miles that way, or you can go five miles this way and five miles that way, or a more clever way of doing it is actually just go straight out, because you really are not in here, you're not actually uh, doing an exercise or anything like that, you would want just to go straight out. You guys that these three things are the same thing, either I go east, north, or I first, you guys go north and then you go east, you're going to end up in the same point or you go northeast, OK? And this distance, if you do the calculation, is going to be 5 times square root of 2, or what is it, 14 divided by 7 miles, OK? This distance is 10 miles. This distance is 10 miles. But the straight, straight, straight shot through is going to be about 7 miles, 7 point something miles, OK? Does this make sense on how we add vectors? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
the vectors are, are, are something that is unique to them and that, that they have direction and magnitude. So you have to have that in mind. Once you have that, then you can add up. Two vectors that have the same magnitude and the same direction are equal, even though they are not drawn in the same place. If this is five miles and this is five miles and both of them are pointing north, they are the same vector actually. So when I write this equal sign, I mean that it is the same, okay? They are not, the fact that I drew it in another point is irrelevant because all I do in this case is retain the, the direction. So again, here is an example of how she's pulling on Nelly Newton, pulling on the sled. Uh, it's, she's pulling at an angle in this case, okay? And this angle is clearly the sum of these two vectors as I was explaining them. This, because we're using sometimes the X and Y coordinates, this is called the X components and this is called the Y components of the vector F in this case. That's why you see the symbol X in here for X component. And this is the Y component, same thing, okay? Because in Cartesian coordinate system, this is the X axis and this is the Y axis and somewhere in there is the origin. And now I can draw any vector I want if I know it's X component and Y component. Knowing it's X component and Y components is the same thing as knowing its magnitude and direction. Actually, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between X components, I mean, between core components and direction and magnitude. Again, this is the same thing in here. So the horizontal component is fx and the, the vertical component is fy. Nelly pulls on the sled as shown. Which component of her force is greater? It looks like in this case, her greater component is fx, okay? So the force is more toward the x-axis than the y-axis, okay? They're looking northeast and north, I mean, uh, east-west or west-east and uh, south-north, then it would say in this case, it's more east than uh, north. Okay, so what two other forces not shown on this sled? So the weight of the sled and the normal forces. This is preparing you actually to do a free body diagram. So if I'm really interested in the sled by itself, the sled, this is my system now. She's not part of it. So in this case, the weight of the sled, including the dog in it, the normal force coming from the surface and this force in here exerted by Nelly, okay? So those are the three system, the three forces applied on Nelly, okay? So two forces act on a block of ice as the ramp is raised, which force remain constant. In this case, the, the uh, MG is going to stay constant because the normal force starts to become less and less in this case until at some point there will be no normal force. When there is no normal force, you are in free fall. Actually, there is some uh, motion in this case because Mg is still causing this motion. So you have a fall, but it's not free. In this case, it's free, okay? So the weight is due to the earth. So it just stays the same, except the normal force in here is how much you're pressing on the, on the earth uh, versus how much you're pressing on the ground versus how much the ground is pushing back on you. So if you're pressing with full Mg in the first case, this normal force is exactly Mg, okay? Now, if you're pressing with less and less, this force in here, which is this component of mg, and this component of mg is less than mg itself. Any component of a vector is less than the vector itself. So it's less than mg. It's even less than mg with the tilt that is super steep. And when the tilt is actually 90 degrees, there is no pressing on the surface. So the ice in this case should fall straight through, okay? Can I try it in here, Joaquin? try an experiment in here. Hopefully, this is a heavy object, okay? So again, in here, it's supposed to be vertical. So as I am trying to tilt it now, the motion starts at some point because of friction right now, you guys don't see it. Now it's going to start and it's not going to stop. So I don't even need to wait till 90 days. This is not a free fall though. Free fall has to have G in it. This is not a G. Uh, it accelerates with less than G, okay? That's how Mr. Galileo, by the way, found the value of G itself. So again, 
So this is actually, can you see that N and MG are equal and opposite in magnitude in the first case? And then as, the, as we incline more and more, there is less and less, and that's why the, sli the, the, the person slides sliding on, the, uh, on the, this, this, this shape in here. So this is the summary of everything in this chapter. Again, that's part of the stuff that you're supposed to know. The first law basically is the law of inertia that states that if an object is under no net forces, that object will stay in its place if it was not moving. If it was moving, it's going to continue moving with the same speed in the same direction. The second law says basically that if an object is under net forces, in this case, its motion is going to change in such a way that the change in motion is equal to the force or proportional to the force divided by the inertia. The more inertia you have, the less change in motion you're going to experience. Acceleration is equal to the force divided by mass. The third law states basically if uh, two objects do interact, then uh, if one of them exerts a force on the other, the other one exerts a force that is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So that is in a nutshell the three laws of Newton that we have seen so far, okay? We still have about more than half an hour, so hopefully we can get some stuff at least from the next chapter. Good? Everybody? Yep. yep. Okay. So let's get into the next chapter. And the next chapter, six, starts with where I left off. And where I left off is why in the world do we have to do chapter six? We just learned everything there is to know in physics. Okay. Forces causes change in motion. There are no force, no change in motion. If an object do interact, one exerts a force on the other, the other one exerts a force that is equal in magnitude and separate and, and uh, different in uh, opposites in sign. So now, all of a sudden, we have the concept of momentum for some reason we will need. And then the concept of impulse, which turned out to be just a change in momentum and the impulse changes momentum and bouncing, which is basically a motion that involves this, this thing, conservation of momentum, which is a general law that is going to emerge off of the fact that if there are no external forces, momentum is conserved quantity. And this is going to lead us to the collisions between two objects. When they collide, there is a conservation of momentum in this case. There are two types of collisions, elastic collisions, where the kinetic energy is conserved, inelastic collisions, where the inner kinetic energy is not conserved. And when I say collision, I really mean collision or I mean implosion or an explosion, two cars colliding, or in this case, two things come apart. So that is really what meant with it by collision and then complicated collisions. So what do you think? Why do we have to do this chapter now? I just said we can do it. We can do everything else. Let me, I know this is probably, uh, let me tell you where the secret lies in here, okay? For this chapter, let me tell you the motivation for this chapter in here. Forces change motion. That we learn from Newton's laws of motion. That we know, force causes or cause, forces cause, change in motion. Okay, that we know, okay? There is a question for it, for, for you guys to see how we can arrive to this thing. Yes, we know that, I, I grant you we know that, okay? That, that's good, we learned, just learned that, okay? If force is given enough time, how does the force change motion? That is the question now. If force, is given, or how does the force do it in time? How does the force changes motion over changes motion over a lapse of time? So that is the question that we want to answer. So this is basically the motivation. Yes, we know the three laws of Newton and the first law, the second law, the third law, we just basically are know about them. And you said that if we know how to use them, we can solve any problem about it. So technically we should be done with this course as of that 
point, but there is a question that we want to answer, and this question is this one. Okay, this is the motivation for chapter six. So this will keep this 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 course basically going. Okay, at least for for right now for chapter six. And the question is the following: How does the force do this over a certain period of time? So we're going to give it time and see how it does it. So the force is applied over a certain period of time t, and we want to know what is, how the force functions basically. We want to understand the mechanics of the force if you wish. How does the force do it? Let me tell you the answer to the question, and this is exactly what the chapter is all about. The object turned out to have momentum before, which is mass times velocity. That's what momentum is. And then after, the force is done with doing what it does, which is changing motion. The, the object will end up with another momentum after. The change in momentum, the difference between this value and this value is what I call impulse, okay? So what it turns out to be in this case is that the force will do an impulse over a period of time in such a way that that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So this is the answer to the question. So we're curious trying to give it ample time to do its trick. So we want to know what happened to the system before and after where the momentum of the object will change over a span of time. And that point of change in momentum is the impulse of the force. As a matter of fact, at the end, we will end up with the following situation. The force times time will be exactly the impulse, which we write it symbolically as the change. This symbol, when you see delta, that is a change in momentum. So the momentum of the object was something, now it's something else. It either increases or decreases. If it's an accelerating force, it's going to increase the momentum of the object. If it, it's less, it's going to decrease. So we need to define momentum. Once we know what momentum is, we're going to define impulse and we derive as the so-called impulse change in momentum theorem. So in this case, now we know the secret of how the force does it. So that is really this chapter. And you already understand the motivation now, why we need to move forward. If you guys don't understand why we need to move forward, there is no point of this chapter. Yes or no? Yes. OK, so basically, this is the motivation for it. We need to define momentum. Once we have the momentum, we're in good shape. There was, uh, what's her name? Emily uh, du Châtelet, which was a French lady who translated the work of Newton. And, uh, and uh, in doing so, she became famous. Actually, she did a lot of work also in her own right and she was married actually to Voltaire if you who had a lot of work also on philosophy and religion and all the things like that actually not religion he was against religion <laughs> against the church for blamed the church for so many things anyway uh, she basically resolved an issue that was bugging people at that time and that was the concept of of oomph okay when an object is moving, people believe at least that it has something they didn't know what to describe it, they call it an oomph. And uh, by looking at the experiment of uh, somebody else, actually she did, she described that as being the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy is coming down the road because they were suspicious of that being just either, is it the mass times velocity or is it the mass times velocity squared? She resolved the debate by coming up with being the mass times the velocity squared. Today, we know this quantity actually has a factor of half in front of it. But other than that, that's how she resolved. Probably when we get into the kinetic energy, we'll see exactly how the reasoning, her reasoning in that, and we will get into it. But for right now, this is another property by itself on its own called the momentum. This mass times velocity is a quantity that has direction. This kinetic energy does not have direction. Whichever way you're moving, you have kinetic energy regardless. This one does not. So momentum by definition is mass times velocity and it arises from a big concept. If I have this object and this object and this object, three of them, for example, making up my system, okay? 
And if all I'm interested in are internal forces, this one pulls on that one by this force, the other one pulls on the other one by the same force equal in magnitude. And it pulls on this one by force, the other one is pulling on that one by force. And this one pulls on the other one by force, the third one pulls on the other force. So if I tally all of these forces, I find zero because everything is basically canceling mutually, okay? However, if for some reason this one flies by itself this way, this two or one or more will fly in the opposite direction to compensate for this motion because of these forces in here. In such a way that the center of mass does not move. If we follow the center of mass, we will arrive naturally at a quantity that is mv. Usually we put the vector on it because it's actually it has direction. And that is a concept of momentum where it comes from, okay? It comes from this idea. Now, if you add to it external forces, then the problem is a little bit more complicated. You're tracking the center of mass, but that's another thing, okay? So this is how we arrive at this one, at least in classical mechanics into the concept of momentum. But that's basically historically, there was a debate actually about this, they called it oomph. I think they're only, okay. They didn't know what it was, but that's what they, so then later on, we have two of them actually. We have the momentum, which is one of them and the kinetic energy is the other. So this is the momentum, this is one of them, okay. So an object that is moving has momentum. An object that is stationary does not have momentum. The more mass you have, the more momentum you have if the object is moving. You're, so in order to achieve a lot of momentum, you either end up with a bigger mass or a bigger velocity, but you have to have both of them. Otherwise you have no momentum, okay? So that's it. So uh, if you have, for example, a small object, let's say, for example, weighs 50 grams, but that object is traveling at, say, for example, 300 meters per second, almost the speed of light, which uh, speed of sound, which is 340 meters per second. So this is a subsonic still, but it's moving super fast. And you have an object in here that weighs a ton or more, okay? It can do a lot of damage to it, and actually it can kill it. If this is an elephant, this is a bullet, this one still has a lot of momentum, albeit its mass is tiny, okay? And this mass is a huge, but if this object is not moving or stationary, then in this case has no momentum. So this thing in here will go straight through and probably cause a lot of damage, in addition to the pressure, by the way, which is another concept that we're gonna see down the road, okay? So mass times velocity is a combination that comes on its own right. Okay, and it comes as what we term as the momentum in this case. Okay, make sense? So a moving object has momentum, has energy, has speed. So it's not A, it's not B, it's not C, it's D, all of the above. Because it has momentum, so it's, it has, it's an object, it has mass, it has velocity. It has energy because I just described the fact that the energy is one half of mv squared. It has speed because the speed is just the magnitude of this, this vector v. So the speed is magnitude of v, the vector v, okay? That's what this symbol means. So all of these three are correct. Therefore, this is correct. Make sense? So when the speed is of an object is doubled, its momentum also is doubled. Again, just look at MV. So you have, for example, a car that weighs about a ton, 1,000 kilograms. Let's say it's moving 50 miles per hour, or let's make it 25 miles per hour because I don't want the car to go 100 miles per hour. So in this case, clearly, its momentum is 1,000 times 25, which was 25,000 kilogram miles per hour. I'm not using SI units, but it's fine, okay? But if this car all of a sudden is going 50 miles per hour, this car now has a momentum that is clearly a thousand kilogram, which is 50,000 kilograms miles per hour. Which one will cause a lot of damage in an accident? The one going faster. 
<laughs> the one with more momentum. You agree, Jacob? Yes. Okay, so the more momentum, the more damage. Okay, so we'll see that connection quickly. So that's basically what the, in a nutshell with this. So the impulse, as I was describing earlier, is actually the force times display uh, the, times the time. Okay. So if you have a cannon in here with a long barrel, and if you have a cannon with a short barrel, this one with the same powder, for example, will result in a cannonball that is subject to a longer time for it to come out. So it's going to come out with a higher impulse. Then with the shorter one in here, that is going to come out with a, 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 a less impulse, okay? Meaning less M times V at the end. If it started with M times V equal to zero before the powder exploded. So this is the change in momentum. So it started with less, and then it's going to end up with a huge one. And the recoil motion also will be higher in this one than this one, okay? So again, because this force in here gave more momentum to result in this impulse. So the force times time is what I call the impulse, okay? And these two quantity, the impulse and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, momentum or change in momentum, they are related to one another. This is actually has some applications. Usually it's a limited application, but it's a good idea to know what the impulse is, okay? So again, if this guy keeps on pushing and pushing and pushing, the car will result in a higher and higher and higher basically momentum, okay? And this is basically the impulse change in momentum theorem. So this is the answer to why we need this stuff, this stuff, STUF in CH6 at least. So that's why we proceeded in here is when we asked if the force is given enough time, what will it do? It's going to change the momentum of an object, okay? So I know this, we have at least a couple of items after the recording today. This is the third item. The third item basically is in this case, uh, explain the change in momentum and impulse law. Put it in your own term. Here is what the law is. Basically, the greater the impulse exerted on something, the greater the change in momentum. I really don't want you guys to copy and paste. I want you to really think about it and see if you can come up with a different verbiage to say the same. Does this make sense? Yes. Is this still going in the chap uh, discussion for chapter five? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to combine those two <clears throat> discussions, okay? okay? Okay, so you can post in the chapter five uh, step also related to chapter six. Because so far we have three stuff, uh, three items in here, okay? So when the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much time, the impulse is of course double two. Remember the impulse in this case is F times T. So if the time is given twice, then the impulse in this case, which is used the letter I, capital I, so it's gonna be double two. So this one double, this one doubles, okay? So that is basically what the idea is. So if this, for example, the ball and the, uh, the stick in here, they stay for a long time in contact, that means giving it more and more impulse, okay? Same thing with the soccer ball. Of course, the precision may be a problem, but at least you give them more the uh, uh, impulse, which is the impulse in here, a change in momentum. So if it was not moving, it had no momentum, but now it's moving with higher momentum, okay? So decreasing momentum over a long time, extend the time during, what is this one? Oh, what is this cases in here? What is case two? What is case one? Oh, here is case one, okay. Increasing momentum, apply the greatest force for as long as possible, and you extend the time of contact. Force can vary throughout the duration of contact. So that's basically, so a golfer swings a golf ball, follows through, baseball player hits a ball and follows through. So in other words, that's going to result in a, uh, in a higher momentum, okay? 
So to decrease the momentum over a long time, extend the time during which momentum is reduced, okay? So in other words, you have an object that is coming in here with high momentum, and you want it to come to a standstill if you want to, okay? So you have a car, typical example. You can, one way of doing it actually is uh, having a wall in here. So you have a car that is moving 50 miles per hour, okay? And let's take the example that this is a, uh, a thousand kilogram car. So this has a momentum that is 50,000 kilogram miles per hour. One way of doing it is put a wall in front of it. And the car will come in here and hit the wall and basically will be smacked against the wall. We'll have very little time to change its momentum. So time is less, so the force must be great in order to result in this change in momentum from 50,000 kilogram meter per, miles per hour down to zero. So the forces of the impact would be higher because this time is very short. Or do the same thing with the hay in here over a long period of time where the car can go through it and come to a standstill at the end, okay? So in this case, the time is long. So the force is less now to do the same thing, to result in the same impulse because the time is longer. So it takes a long time to slow down a car on a hay or for example, or whatever friction or something. So in this case, you're gonna to come to a standstill. Let's say for example, your brakes are not working. So you have two options, go through hay or go through a, a wall. You're gonna to come to a standstill. Which one would you rather do? Which one will have less force? That is your choice now. Okay, does this make sense to you guys? Yes. Okay. So all of this are just examples of the same thing when uh, when uh, plates, for example, fall on a hard rock or hard basically plate uh, surface or a soft surface, like for example, when you have carpet where it takes long time for it to lose its momentum. So there is better chance for it not to break unless, for example, it sits on a hard surface where there is the impact is immediate and the time is very short and the impulse is very high. In this case, because it changes in momentum, and uh, the force is going to be very high, which can be more damaging. So all of this example. So this is the example I was talking about, except this one is in a, a truck. Okay. So MV is high in this case. Okay. It's the same MV. And uh, here in option one is through a haystack. And in this case, what you're going to do, you're going to have very long time. So the change in momentum is going to come back to very little force time is a long time. Whereas in this case, it's a very big force time is a small time. And in this case, the damage was coming from the force itself. And that's exactly what caused that bug to be smashed against the, uh, against the, uh, the bus because of the high force in this case, because actually its momentum was high to begin with, combined with the momentum of the truck. And that results in a big force on it to cause it to be damaged, okay? Whereas the truck has the same force, but in this case, it was not damaged as much because of its inertia actually at that time. And this example is the same thing. So if somebody hits you when you're playing boxing, just pull back so that the, the time is longer for the smash unless if you move forward, then it's gonna be a problem. Same thing with this girl in here, okay? So if she exerts this force with very short period of time, she can do damage to these things. She can break them actually, this break, this break, um, bricks. Whereas if she takes her sweet time going through them, she needs to apply tremendous force to actually cause the same damage. Do you guys understand? But if she goes very quick, the time is very short, the force that results from that impulse is gonna be very high force, okay? Versus if she comes in very slow, take her sweet time and press against them, she may not even move them. Okay, so that is the trick behind it. So again, here is the idea. So you have a surface in here. You have a ball that comes in and hits smash on the floor. What would happen to those two balls they used to have in here? I didn't pull them. So one of them comes in and come to a standstill. So let's say, for example, it's traveling with a momentum, okay? It has its momentum in here. Let's, for the sake of examples in here, take this mass to being 0 0.1 kilogram, which is like an apple hitting the ground at let's say for example, 10 meters per second. So its momentum is 10 times 0 0.1 is clearly one kilogram meter per second. 
it lost it completely. So it's change in momentum is going to be zero minus one kilogram meter per second. So the impulse in this case is negative one kilogram meter per second. And the negative means that it lost it. Okay. Whereas in this situation, a ball that bounces comes back, hits the ground and end up upward. Let's take the same mass and the same velocity with the exception now the, scale, the, the above velocity is actually a, a negative one meter per second because this is positive one meter per second coming down. So when it's moving in the opposite direction must be negative. So the final momentum when it bounces is gonna be negative one meter per second times the one kilogram, no, negative 10, I'm sorry, negative 10. This is 10 and this is 10 because that's how we started this hypothesis in here. So negative 10 times 0.1 is gonna result in this 0.1 kilogram is gonna result in the same one kilogram meter per second moving up. This is the final momentum. Minus the initial momentum, which was coming down and the, the initial momentum is negative one kilogram meter per second. So the total change in momentum or the impulse in this situation is gonna be negative two kilogram meter per second. So if an object bounces off of something, it has more impulse than if it just stick to it, okay? So that's basically in a nutshell what this is talking about, okay? So if an object hits the ground and bounces up, then in this case it has more momentum than if it just hits the ground because it lost it, end up, end up with zero uh, momentum at the end. We still have about 10 minutes and I think we're gonna be able to. Conservation of momentum has to do basically with the fact that for the case of the cannonball in here, the little mass times the bigger velocity moving this way. So it's moving this way. And the big mass times with a little, little velocity, if I add them up and initially the thing was not moving, they should be zero. This velocity of the cannonball is small now moving this way, but the mass is big. And this one is a big velocity, but the mass is small. So if I multiply this small mass by that big uh, velocity, it's the same thing that big mass times a little velocity because momentum is conserved. It doesn't uh, change. So here is the before. When these guys were not moving at all, it was zero. And here is the after when they are moving. If this one takes, for example, moving forward 50 kilogram meter per second, the, the, cannon, the cannon itself will take another negative 50 kilogram meter per second. And the net sum of them is zero. If, for example, the cannonball is just one kilogram, then it must be moving with 50 meters per second forward, high velocity. Versus the, the cannonball, let's say, for example, for the sake of argument, it's 100 kilograms. If it's 100 kilogram, 50 divided by 100 is 0.5. So it's gonna move with half a meter per second. So the cannonball will move forward backward with a speed that is half a meter per second versus that of the cannonball, the, the cannon itself, the cannonball itself that's going to travel 50 meters per, per, per second in forward. And the sum of the two momenta is still zero because this one 50 times one is positive 50 kilometer, kilograms meter per second forward. And the other one negative, I mean 100 times negative half and that's gonna be also negative 50 kilograms per meter per second. And this is an algebraic sum. You add the positive to the negative and you end up with zero because initially you started with zero to begin with. So this is an example of an explosion. This is true also for the implosion. So when cannon is fired, the force on the cannonball inside the cannon barrel is equal and opposite to the force on the cannonball uh, uh, of the cannonball on the cannon. The cannonball gains momentum while the moment uh, while the cannon gains an equal uh, amount of momentum in the opposite direction the cannon uh, recoils. When no external forces are present, no external impulse is present, and no change in momentum is possible because if external forces are not there. Are equal to zero the impulse which is force times displacement is zero and if the impulse is zero that means the change the symbol data delta in here is the change in mv is zero that means mv before the momentum before is the same as the mv after or the momentum after and this is the conservation of 
mo uh, momentum, which plays a major role in understanding a lot of phenomena actually in billiards, for example, but also plays a major role in understanding, for example, what's going on in the molecules in the air and also for nuclear accelerators. And it has a lot of applications everywhere, okay? The least of which is collisions, of course. So internal molecular forces with the, within a baseball come in, uh, come in pairs, cancel one another out and have no effect on the momentum of the ball. So molecular forces within a baseball have no effect on its momentum. Pushing against a car's dashboard has no momentum on its, on its own. Um, has no effect on its own momentum, okay? So if you push the car from inside, you're not gonna push the car basically because you're pushing on the car, the car is pushing back and the car is not gonna be moving. So you sit in the car and try to push it from inside, it's not gonna go out anywhere. And this is exactly what we're talking about, collisions, when this is true, when momentum is conserved, okay? So we're talking about a collision. There are two basic cases of collisions. One of them is elastic collisions. And elastic collisions are by definition where the kinetic energy is conserved, okay? And occurs when cold objects rebound without deformation or any generation of heat, okay? So that means the kinetic energy before is equal to the kinetic energy after because there is no change in this, this amount there. The potential or energy also stays the same. In elastic collision, when there is deformation actually in this case, so when you have two parts, for example, coming together and they stick to one another. Let's say for the sake of argument, this is a thousand kilogram and this is a thousand kilogram because they are similar. So when this one sticks to the other after they collide, like with the Velcro or something like that, and this one is traveling with 10 meters per second. So obviously I have 10,000 kilogram meter per second of momentum before. So this is before they collide, before they fuse. After they fuse, I better have the same quantity, but now I have two times the mass. I have two times one kilogram, 1,000 kilogram mass. I need to multiply it by number in such a way that that number equal to the momentum before, which is 10,000 kilogram meter per second. So how much two times 1,000 I need to multiply with to get this 100, uh, to get this 10,000? What's the number I should plug in here for this equation to work? What do you guys think? Two times 1,000 is 2,000. So here's the question then. What should I multiply 2,000 by to get 10,000? Five. Five. Five meters per second. So once they fuse, they move with five meters per second. So in this case, it's a collision where the momentum is conserved. So this is the momentum before and the momentum after. But it's clearly the kinetic energy is not conserved in this case because there is deformation. I'm um, trying to find the kinetic energy. It's going to be one half times 1,000 times 10 squared, which is going to be 100,000 divided. It's going to be 50,000 joules. Whereas at the end, one half times 1,000, that's 1,000, times just five squares is going to be about 25,000. Actually, there is a loss in kinetic energy in this case. Okay. Again, you're not really responsible for this kind of mathematics at this point, but I'm hoping that you guys understand the idea, which is the key in here. Again. This is how we got to that number five meters per second. Because the mass I put in a thousand, you can put any number, it's going to cancel anyway, as long as they are the same cars. Okay. Again, if you have more general cases, you have these are vectors actually. So during a collision, when they fuse, they can go at an angle. Okay. So that is the point with it in here. That is the case of an implosion. The case of an explosion is similar. So when you have, for example, a a, a, a grenade, and all of a sudden now it splits into many, many pieces, then that those pieces, they can fly every which way. But in this case, the momentum is before is the momentum after. So will, they will all keep on moving with MB as a sum. But some of them will travel this way, and the others will travel in the opposite direction to compensate for one another. OK, so this is in a nutshell, this chapter is five and six. OK. And uh, please don't forget your assignments. And I'm going to follow up this lecture today with a survey about the time change. Any questions? We still have about a minute before the class is over.
If not, then I'm going to stop the recording. And I will see you guys on Thursday.